Welcome to another beautiful Thursday morning. You're listening to Bhavani at IE Green on the Progressive Radio Network. And I'm so thrilled to be here with all of you today. I have a great show planned. My guest will be Brian Tokar. He is the author of a new book called Climate Justice and Community Renewal, Resistance and Grassroots Solution. And he's also a professor and lecturer in the Department of Environmental Studies at the University of Vermont. And I'll tell you more about him in just a little bit when he comes on. But first, I want to talk to you about things going on in the news, ways that you can take action, and, of course, my recipe for this week. So um, I actually wrote about our broken food system this week and how it is linked to climate change and the pandemic and racial injustice, our health, the obesity crisis, all of these things can really be traced back to our broken food system. And um, the more people realize how our food system impacts all of these things, then we can make some change about it. And Senator Cory Booker, who is a vegan, is um, you know really trying to move that conversation ahead. And he has a bill in Congress right now that he's trying to get passed, and he just signed on a letter with over 300 farm, food, and environmental advocacy organizations to Congress asking them to support the bill that would reduce and eventually eliminate CAFOs. CAFOs are con- concentrated animal feeding operations, and that's the main way that most of the meat in this country is produced. And these CAFO operations don't have to meet any type of regulations with the waste of these animals. You know, a city has to meet certain, um, you know, has to go through a certain way of dealing with the human waste that cities produce. But the animal waste is even more than the human waste, and there is no regulations in really how they have to deal with it. And they just dump it into these big um, wells of water, um, and it leaks into the into the soil, leaks into our waterways. Um, the hormones and antibiotics that they feed to these animals, uh, the GMO feed that these animals eat, it's just all a bad system. And every single part of it is bad, and we just need to do away with it. So um, this bill needs support, and you can sign a uh, Petitions to let you, or not petitions, but you can write to your Congress representatives and let them know that you want them to support this. Global warming is really just showing up everywhere. I mean, we're seeing all these fires um, out in California and the Pacific Northwest. We're seeing stronger and stronger and more frequent hurricanes. Um, And nowhere is it more apparent right now than in the Arctic. We are seeing... The ice melting, um, where we used to have lots of snow and ice, it's being replaced by lots of water and rain. And it's really impacting native Alaskan villages um, here in this country and, of course, you know, native communities all across the planet are having to deal with this. So uh, we will be talking more about climate change and the climate crisis and what needs to be done um, when Brian Tokar comes on, but ways that you can take action. Uh, If you're in New York this week, I will be marching on Sunday, starting at Columbus Circle, for the Climate Justice Through Racial Justice March and Rally. And it's just, you know, really important that we all recognize how the climate crisis is impacting the marginalized communities way more as well as the pandemic, we're seeing that, that, you know, um, a study just came out that children who are getting the pandemic, if they are from marginalized communities, black, brown, indigenous, they are much more likely to get the pandemic and then also have bad outcomes from the pandemic. So how all these things are connected um, to racism is really striking. And this march is really going to hopefully raise awareness and just keep the momentum going and the energy behind this cause really pushing forward. 
Another thing that I wrote about this week is putting unemployed oil field workers back to work, plugging up abandoned oil wells. There's thousands of abandoned oil wells across the country, oil wells from um, from drilling operations and fracking operations. And, you know, I am very sensitive to the fact, as I call for uh, um, getting away from fossil fuels, that that will leave so many people unemployed and we really need to help train these workers for other jobs in, um, in renewable energy or in other fields that are good. But in the meantime, these workers who know how, how to plug up these wells, they can be put to work doing that. And it's just a great time to do that. And so, um, Please sign the petition for that. And Consumers Reports came out with an article on the pesticides in fruits and vegetables. And this is no secret. I mean, the Cornucopia Institute has, you know, been writing about that for years. The Environmental Working Group has had their Clean 15 list and Dirty Dozen list for years. But these are fruits and vegetables that are just loaded with pesticides. And as much as we want everyone to eat fruits and vegetables, you're not doing yourself a service if you're eating fruits and vegetables that are loaded with pesticides. So um, take a look at the list. Avoid the vegetables that are loaded with pesticides. Buy organic whenever possible. Consumer Reports actually came out that even organic spinach has pesticides on it. Um, so, you know, there it goes to a big plug for knowing your local farmer and knowing where your spinach is coming from. Um, the more we can buy local and support local and support the farmers that are doing it right, the better it is for all of us. So um, please, when you can, shop at a farmer's market, join a CSA. It's late now for this year, obviously. But right now with the fall harvest and all these fruits and vegetables coming up, it's just a great time to really load up your plate with harvest, um, the bounty of the harvest right now. But do it and make sure that the vegetables and fruits you're buying are free of pesticides. And now I would like to share with all of you my recipe for this week. It's a super simple recipe. It's a recipe I've shared before, but when I shared it before, it actually had dairy. Since January, I've been eating vegan, and so I repurposed this recipe to be vegan. So it's my caramelized onion and fig pizza. <clears throat> this is with a cashew rose water cream. And this recipe is just, you know, so delicious. And every year when I see the figs in the marketplace, I just have to buy them. I have a fig tree that I'm waiting for years to get my figs off of, and they have yet to produce figs for me. Um, so I will continue purchasing figs locally until mine start producing. But anyway, this is a great recipe, super easy, <clears throat> especially with the delicious frozen wood-fired pizza crust that you can now buy at Trader Joe's. Of course, Trader Joe's also sells the dough that you can roll out yourself, which is a wonderful way to go. Um, so whatever pizza crust you like, whether you want to just buy a pizza crust, make a pizza crust, um, it's all good. But you're going to start with a this recipe. I'm starting with a package of the Trader Joe's frozen wood-fired pizza crust. And two come in a package. And this recipe is good for two. So you're going to start with two onions that you're going to dice up, a quarter teaspoon of salt, plus a pinch of salt, one pint of fresh figs cut into wedges, one cup of cashews soaked in boiling water for about an hour, a half a cup of water, one tablespoon of rose water, one tablespoon of honey, a balsamic vinegar glaze that you can either make by boiling some balsamic vinegar down with just a little bit of honey, or you can buy Brad's organic balsamic glaze, which is great, and it's just balsamic vinegar and honey, um, or and a tablespoon of fresh mint chopped. So you're going to drain the cashews and pulse them in a food processor, then add a half a cup of water to the... Um, to the food process and continue pulsing and blending it until it's really smooth. And you don't want to be able to see any graininess in it at all. You want it to be completely fluffy and smooth. 
So just keep pulsing and blending that until you get that way. You can also do this, of course, in a um, Vitamix. That would do it as well. Um, then, you, while that's going, you can saute the onions in some olive oil, um, adding one tablespoon of water as you're sauteing so that you don't have to use too much oil. And that will just keep the onions from sticking in the pan. So you can put start with you know a tablespoon or two of olive oil in the pan, saute the onions, but as they start sticking to the bottom, just add one tablespoon of water at a time to keep it from sticking. Um, and then you just add a pinch of salt to that and continue cooking until the onions are really caramelized and delicious. Then you're going to add the tablespoon of rose water, the quarter teaspoon of salt, and honey to the cashews and blend that up just a little bit more. Then spread the cashew cream out on both crusts, leaving about a half-inch edge around the crust. Then spread out the onions evenly onto both pizza crusts. Place the figs all around the pizzas on top in a nice um, geometric um, design. And you're going to bake it in as hot an oven as your oven goes. Mine goes up to like 500 degrees. And bake it directly on the rack for about six minutes. When you remove it, then you're going to drizzle it with the balsamic glaze and garnish it with the fresh mint. And that is it. It is delicious. It is, um, you know, a beautiful appetizer or it can actually be a main meal an individual pizza with a beautiful in-season salad on the side. Um, it's just great. What could be better? So um, I also forgot to mention, last week I talked about that I was starting a mushroom farm, and then I said not really, but we actually did um, inoculate oak logs this week with shiitake mushroom spores, and then we also had oyster mushrooms that we inoculated straw, and then we have these big bags, vertical bags of mushrooms hanging in our basement. So if you want to see some photos of that, you can go onto my website for that. But we really had fun doing that, and um, it was just a great activity. So now it's my pleasure to introduce to all of you Brian Tokar. He is an activist and author. Um, his latest book is Climate Justice and Community Renewal, Resistance and Grassroots Solutions, which he... Um, wrote uh, along with Tamara Gibbertson. And um, he is a lecturer in, in the Environmental Studies Program at the University of Vermont, and he's an active board member of 350 Vermont, as well as the Institute for Social Ecology. The Institute for Social Ecology is a great organization. I'm sure we'll be talking about that. Brian was the director from 2008 to 2015. He's written other books as well. He's the author of The Green Alternative, Earth for Sale, and Toward Climate Justice, Perspectives on the Climate Crisis and Social Change. He's also edited three volumes of, in biotechnology and food issues, including Agriculture and Food in Crisis, which was co-edited with Fred Magdoff in 2010. And I'm really excited to have him on to talk about his latest book, um, Climate Justice and Community Renewal. Brian, are you with me? Yes, Bhavani, it's terrific to be with you. Thank you for having me on. Sure, thanks so much for coming on. I know how busy we all are, so I really appreciate it. I thought we could first talk, talk about um, the title of your book, because climate justice you know, it seems to be the new term. You know, for years we were talking about climate change and climate crisis, and now we're hearing more and more about climate justice. And I thought you maybe could talk a little bit what's meant by climate justice and how is it related to social justice and racial justice. They seem to blend together. Yes, absolutely. Um, first of all, I want to echo what you said earlier in the program, which is there's no question that we're in a climate crisis, not just the Arctic, but of course we have uh, a pace of wildfire activity on the West Coast and the Pacific Northwest that is unprecedented. We have uh, the latest map I saw, seven hurricanes brewing in the the South and Central Atlantic, something that's also never happened before, that's clearly correlated with the excess heat in the oceans due to climate change. Right. But talking about the 
science and the specifics and the meteorology of climate change is no longer enough. We know that around the world, people are disproportionately impacted by the effects of climate change. Uh, if they experience poverty, if they're part of communities that have been historically marginalized, if they live in the tropics and subtropics, if they're part of communities that have historically tried to live close to the, closer to the land, which is something that many of us aspire to. So climate justice focuses on the disproportionate impacts of climate change on the world's poorest and most marginalized people. And this is not a new phenomenon. I personally started getting involved in climate justice work uh, in the mid 2000s when this awareness was first starting to brew. But the UN's been collecting data on this. And it turns out that going back to even the 1980s, um, people in the poorer countries in what's known as the global south were affected by climate change uh, by a factor of something like 50 times greater than people in the wealthiest countries. So to take effective action around the climate crisis, we need to really look closely at the social justice dimensions, at the racial justice dimensions, and by highlighting the experiences of those people in the world who have historically and are also today the most disproportionately impacted by climate change, we can think about a much more holistic climate movement than we've seen in the past. And that's a movement that, uh, as indicated by the, the march coming up this weekend in New York and, and many other events around the world, this is a, a rising awareness. And yeah. it's, it's a really positive development, I think. I agree with you. Um, you know, I had a guest on last week, uh, an indigenous man from Puerto Rico who actually lives in the States now, but talking about how, you know, his people who have been living close to the land have been impacted. And it's just, you know, it's a huge, huge problem. And the more that we realize it and make those connections, the more hopefully people will take it seriously and come on board. Yeah, so. and organizations like the Indigenous Environmental Network that's based here in the U.S. but works internationally uh, have really been in the forefront of furthering this understanding of climate justice. Mm hmm. Right. And, they were, you know, even when I was talking about in the Arctic, you know, those are the native communities up there that um, that are being so impacted by the melting ice and the rising sea levels and these whole communities that have been there for I don't know, hundreds of thousands of years. I don't know how long they're <laughs> having to tens. move, pick up thousands. and figure out yeah. another place to go. You know, it's just um, really horrible. Yes. So, um, so the awareness, the links to social and racial justice um, evolved within the climate movement. How is this awareness, um, you know, how is this awareness growing? And how do the priorities of climate justice differ from the more traditional approaches to the climate crisis? Well, the climate movement traditionally and understandably has focused on trying to help people understand the basic scientific realities of climate change. And that's tremendously important. But from a climate justice perspective, it's not enough. And our movement is much stronger when we're able to acknowledge the immediate human impacts and really learn directly from the experiences of people in various parts of the world who are and have historically been the most impacted. So the first really striking contribution of climate justice is illuminating and highlighting those voices from the global south, from places like Puerto Rico, uh, which is uh, addressed in, in my new book by two agroecology pioneers in Puerto Rico who talk about how farms that have adopted agroecology methods, 
were really in the forefront of the recovery from the devastating hurricanes that swept the Caribbean, the entire Caribbean region, uh, just a couple of years ago. Um, people from rainforested regions who, who work with indigenous people in South America who have been dealing with the dual impact of uh, increased destruction of their forests, which is also related to climate change and also related to some of the false solutions to climate change. The idea that we can buy and sell carbon credits on an international market, uh, which is considered by climate justice activists to be a false solution to the climate crisis. Uh, yes, I just heard the Democratic the um... by uh, timber plantations and, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, just heard from Food and Water Watch, you know, the Democrats came out with a new platform that totally does not address the climate crisis adequately at all. You right. know, it, um, it's just unbelievably depressing when the, the Democratic Party is the party I have to support, and they're coming out with a bogus, greenwashed, platform that does nothing to really address the problem. And it's very, very upsetting. Very it is upsetting. I mean, it's a step beyond the blatant denialism of the current administration, uh, which if they had their way would really destroy the whole body of environmental law in this country. But uh, it's not enough and we need to keep the pressure on. Yeah. You know, and part of the problem is the People in power who have money, who are making the decisions, don't necessarily really care about the marginalized communities. You know, um, the uh, head of the Sierra Club or someone from the Sierra Club just came out with a, a quote just saying, you know, disposable, you know, disposable communities, disposable people, disposable land. It doesn't, they don't feel it. They don't, they, you know, they don't feel it. And, you know, as long as their world and their reality to, up here doesn't change, they're happy. And it's just, you know, we really need to look at the planet as one planet and we're all connected. And, you know, this, I don't know whether I want to call it white supremacy or this, you know, people of power with money, they just don't get it. And it's, you know, it's just amazing to me that they can just turn their backs on those that are being infected by this. Yes, uh, white supremacy is a central part of this, and yeah. so is the entire nature of the profit system that the current world economy runs on. Uh, for many decades, the oil industry and other fossil fuel industries have been the most profitable uh, forms of economic activity. And that's given the fossil fuel companies, of course, disproportionate political influence, not only in this country, but in many countries around the world. And one of the central elements of the climate movement as a whole that climate justice has served to really further is, is the need to really dismantle the disproportionate political influence of the oil companies. The good news is that um, with the current coronavirus pandemic, uh, the demand for fossil fuels has begun to decline. And if you look at the business press, which is, of course, how many of those people in, in power uh, with, with excess wealth uh, tell each other what they think is important, uh, there's a real likelihood that the beginning is the bottom is beginning to fall out from the excess political influence of the oil companies. Uh, and they're starting to see that maybe we have actually reached the absolute historical maximum of demand for fossil fuels. And it's going to be all downhill for them uh, from here on, which is uh, one of the few positive signs of uh, from the developments of the last six months. Yeah. Absolutely. So let's talk about your book. You just came out with a new book, Climate Justice and Community Renewal, Resistance and Grassroots Solutions. Can you share with us um, what you were trying to accomplish with this book and what was your inspiration? Yes. Well, um, as 
the climate justice movement has developed and people have become increasingly aware of the contributions and the tremendous wisdom that's emerged from communities all around the world in response to the climate crisis, um, I felt there was a need to really create a platform to bring more of those voices uh, to public attention. So uh, I and my colleague, Tamara Gilbertson, uh, assembled a group of people, many of whom have been in the forefront of international climate justice advocacy for a decade or two. And um, we put together about 15 contributed chapters from all around the world, from nearly every continent, uh, and gave people the platform to express their own views and describe their own histories of both resisting the fossil fuel industry and trying in the course of that to rebuild their own communities. So we have leading African climate justice advocates like Neil Obasi, who used to be the head of Friends of the Earth International, Patrick Bond, who's a professor in South Africa, who's been traveling around the world talking about their work. Um, I mentioned the two agroecologists from Puerto Rico who have a chapter. Uh, we have reports from indigenous people fighting dams uh, in eastern Canada, from, as I mentioned, rainforest people, both in South America and also in India, who are trying to deal with uh, the continuing excess of resource extraction from their parts of the world and develop new models of community resilience uh, with uh, traditional forest dwelling people in their regions. Uh, Tom Goldtooth, who's the founder of the Indigenous Environmental Network that I mentioned, and really probably the first person to uh, publicly use the phrase climate justice coming out of the people of color-led environmental justice movement that made so many important gains uh, starting in the 1980s. Uh, Tom, among others, began to articulate back in the early 2000s the need to take the next step from environmental justice to climate justice. And he lays out a whole indigenous just transition platform to really try to deal with something that you mentioned, which is the, the problem of people whose livelihood has historically depended on uh, fossil fuel extraction and other destructive industries and how to create a transition to a renewable world that uh, they can also see a place for themselves in. We have inspiring stories from uh, cities like Detroit that have developed programs of community renewal, including amazing network of community gardens uh, in response to the decline of the auto industry in Detroit, models of energy democracy from various cities around uh, New York State and also an account of the emergence of a, a green cities movement all across Western and, and Central Europe. So a focus on resistance, a focus on renewal, a focus on really pulling together the voices of people on the ground who are doing this incredibly inspiring and pioneering work. Mm -hmm. It's very exciting. Can you share with us some of the... Um unique perspectives that you saw, you know, what you thought was some of the most ingenious, you know, amazing um, projects going that is really mobilizing people? Um, well, one of my favorite chapters is, is one I've already mentioned, and that's the one from Puerto Rico. Um, Nelson Alvarez, who's an agroecologist and also a social ecologist. He was a student of ours at the Institute for Social Ecology back in the 1990s. And his colleague, George Felix, um, talk about the recovery uh, from Hurricane Maria, which devastated many Caribbean islands uh, just a couple of years ago. Uh, people might remember that much of Puerto Rico was without electricity for many months. People had a hard time getting food. And the 
places that really advanced the recovery and moved it forward and created an example that made it possible for people to begin to thrive amidst the chaos were uh, a number of well-organized farms that had already adopted the program of agroecology, which is a very holistic approach to growing food that's not only organic, but that really draws upon the patterns that we know of, of life in the soil, of life on the land, working with the land rather than against it the way the chemical industry does, um, and advancing those holistic methods of growing food in order to really drive the recovery from the hurricane. Um, I mentioned Detroit, which for many decades people know was was dominated by the auto industry. And the auto industry started to move out of Detroit back in the 1980s and 90s, both relocating to other places and also, of course, uh, significantly automating production. So they just didn't need as many people. And the population of Detroit started to fall and is something like a third to a half less population than they had in the 1980s, which created a lot of vacant land. And people started moving onto that land and building gardens. And there are huge gardens all over Detroit that are about feeding people in the city and also creating alternative modes of employment for people who have been displaced, <coughs> excuse me, by the decline in auto production. Um, those are just a couple of examples. We have people in Bolivia who have been resisting privatization of their water resources now for 20 years, beginning to create new community controlled uh, models of water management, which is, of course, increasingly important as the climate crisis brings us uh, increased threat of droughts in many, many parts of the world. Those are a few of the examples that, that I carry with me on, a, on an ongoing basis from this book that I think people can learn a lot from. Now, one, you mentioned Detroit, and it's interesting because um, one of my previous guests I don't know if you know a gentleman named Malik Yakini, but he is from the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. And I've had him on a couple times and a few years in between. The second time I had him on, I was, you know, talking about all the wonderful things I was hearing that was going on in Detroit and how, you know, it was great to see its comeback and, you know, all this. And he, he said, yeah, it's, but it's not for the people of color. You know, it's the comeback so much was for like young white people who had an opportunity to buy cheap land or buy cheap, you know, run down houses that they could fix up that had the money that could get the loans, but that the people of color that were there, which was still the majority of Detroit, that it really wasn't changing their reality that much. Uh, but that was probably already two years ago since I had him on last. Um, have you seen that? Has that changed now? Um, Are the opportunities well, you know, I, I think that from is from one of the problems in Detroit uh, that, you know, there's some gentrification and that's an issue that's addressed in the chapter in Detroit for, in this book. But there's an organization in Detroit called the, the James and Grace Lee Boggs Center. And James Boggs was a radical organizer in the auto industry starting in the 1960s. And Grace Lee Boggs was a, a, a leading uh, voice of, of radical philosophy internationally. And they got together and uh, started this program of community renewal rooted in the black community really back in the, the 1990s. And there have been periods of time uh, when wealthy people have tried to move in and take advantage of, of cheap land and propose, for example, commercial scale farms that would mainly be about uh, you know feeding the, the corporate food system. But what remains from those experiments in the 1990s are many cooperative efforts rooted in the black community uh, that really are about feeding people in the community. And, you know, like any 
major city, there are tensions between different sectors of the community. And sometimes you take a few steps forward, but also are, are pushed back. And I think what your other guest described is, is clearly an example of that. But um, the, the two contributors, uh, Shay Howell, who's been working in, in Detroit, uh, she was one of Grace Lee Boggs's closest uh, confidants uh, until Grace died at the age of 100 just a few years ago. And there's a terrific PBS documentary about her and about Grace Boggs and her work that really highlights the community-centered dimensions of this struggle. And they talk about, in their chapter, the fight against gentrification, the fight against uh, the commercialization of this movement and efforts to do that, but also tremendous pushback and uh, a magazine that uh, comes out of, of their project that I had the name of on the tip of my tongue and just lost it, that okay. people can look up online that, uh, that really highlights the, the community-centered dimensions continuing uh, to, to, to thrive in Detroit. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, great. I I look forward to um, reading them. I haven't gotten the book yet, but I am really looking forward to it. Um, we're going to take a couple minute break. And when we come back, um, I want to talk more about the bo book and how local resistance to fossil fuels and other climate abuses related to the goal, how that is related to the goal of community renewal, because I think that's a real, fo you know, such a focus of your book and so important. So everyone listening, I'm talking with Brian Tokar, and you're listening to Bhavani at IE Green. Be right back. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. You're listening to Bhavani at IE Green on the Progressive Radio Network. If you're just joining us, my guest today is Brian Tokar. He's the author of Climate Justice and Community Renewal and a professor at the University of Vermont. And we're talking about his book. And right before the break, I was asking him how local resistance to fossil fuels and other climate abuses are related to the goal of community renewal. Brian? Yes, and um, I looked up the name of that magazine from Detroit, which I'd like to plug. It's called yeah. Riverwise, and that really focuses on the initiatives mostly from the black community in Detroit to resist gentrification and create models of community renewal in the face of the, the economic problems there. Um, many, many... <clears throat> many, many examples. Um, on the resistance side, um, I have a chapter from Scott Parkin, who's with the uh, Rainforest Action Network that people might be familiar with, who's also one of the founders of the, direct the Climate Direct Action Network, Rising Tide, looking at some of the models of resistance to fossil fuel extraction, starting with... Um, the movement, <clears throat> excuse me, the movement of people in coal dependent communities in Appalachia, resisting mountaintop removal, all the way up to um, the resistance against the Keystone XL oil pipeline, which of course is still an impending threat, and the inspiring struggle in Standing Rock in North Dakota just a few years ago, uh, looking at how people in those various movements challenging the fossil fuel industry have organized themselves and really created uh, resilient communities of resistance that uh, help many people around the country uh, figure out how to challenge this sometimes uh, overwhelmingly powerful industry. You know, in just the last couple of months, we've seen three or four major pipeline projects canceled, some by the companies deciding it was no longer worth it for them, uh, some as a result of legal interventions by the communities. And uh, really for the first time, I think we can say that despite the efforts of the Trump administration to promote fossil fuels and expand fossil fuels and even subsidize the coal industry, which was uh, starting to go bankrupt uh, several years ago, uh, we're starting to see some new victories in the struggle 
against the expansion of fossil fuels. Yeah. Um, I mentioned the Green City Network in Europe, Carl Ludwig Scheibel, who was the director of that network for many years and still heads up its uh, Italian branch, has a chapter in the book where he documents through data and uh, descriptions of various policy measures, the emergence of a real green cities movement uh, across Europe where uh, how people live day to day in many European cities has really been transformed where people are becoming much less dependent on, uh, on their cars, uh, where the centers of major cities uh, have become places where it's safe for people to be out on foot and on bicycles, uh, where people are building gardens, where people are, are really changing how they live in fundamental ways. And yeah, well, I in this think Europe country, was much closer to living a more... Um, ecologically sound lifestyle to start with. I mean, you know, all across Europe, they shop as they need to. You know, it's it's very common to go to the go to the market on your way home from work to get what you need for that night's dinner. You know, and they bring their own yes. bags. And you know, there's not this big box store mentality the way there is here of loading up in so much and you know so much packaging and all that stuff. I think. Um, you know, they're ahead of us already because they never got into this bad, um, bad system to start with. Although there are major supermarket chains become players in, in many countries. And uh, just as we were talking about in Detroit, there's a continuing tension between those people who want to live greener and more sustainably and the interest and the commercial interests that are all about trying to do the opposite. Mm -hmm. So let, can we talk about the connection of climate justice and our food system, since that's what I'm so um, involved in. How is our food system um, connected to climate justice and social justice? Can we talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, first of all, um, we know that the f current food system is a major source of emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Uh, and the estimates vary widely. If you look at the statistics from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, they talk about agriculture in the U.S. representing, uh, I think it's 16 percent of greenhouse gas emissions. But if you look at the food system as a whole, all the transportation, all the chemical production, um, all the waste, um, it's closer to 25 and by some estimates, possibly as high as 50% of the climate problems <clears throat> stem from aspects of the food system, especially if you take into account the massive changes in land use, the destruction of forests and grasslands to uh, open up land for commercial scale agriculture in South America and in many other parts of the world. If you take that into account, our current industrial food system could be responsible for as much as half of the, the climate problems that we have. So by changing to a more localized, uh, more organic, less chemical dependent and less fossil fuel dependent food system, we're making a huge contribution toward alleviating the climate problems that we have. At the same time, the food system and agriculture in particular is one of the areas most directly impacted by changes in the climate. We have places all around the world and we, we've seen a little bit of that here uh, in the Northeast and especially in Northern New England over the last couple of growing seasons where we've had periods of drought that have had a huge impact on our ability to grow our own food. Um, 
But like everything else in the climate story, it's much more severe in, in places in the global south. And Oxfam and other organizations have estimated that if we're not able to do something about the climate situation, that, that people in the tropics and subtropics might be facing drought-related crop failures as often as every other year, which is an extremely serious situation. So the food system and the climate problem are intimately connected, and they're connected in, in both directions. The climate crisis affecting our ability to grow food and uh, the current food system being one of, if not the largest contributors to uh, how serious the climate situation has become. Yeah, it really is. And how, how have you seen um, students, I, you know, as a professor in environmental studies, how have you seen the change in students' activism or complacency? Have you seen, a, you know, more motivation amongst them, or is it just so overwhelming of the the – negative impacts that people don't know where to start and people just choose to look the other way and do nothing. What are you seeing? Well, it can be, it can be overwhelming, but I think the current generation of students are incredibly motivated to see big changes in their lifetime to relieve these problems. Uh, the, we know that student activism has played a tremendous role in the current wave of the climate movement internationally, starting, of course, with the, the school strikes in Europe initiated by Greta Thunberg and, and others, uh, the student strike that happened all around the world, including here in the U.S., really just a year ago this week. People might not remember because of everything that's happened that's sometimes so overwhelming in the last six months with the coronavirus, but there was a student strike that, that swept the world uh, in mid-September last year that uh, got a lot of attention. Yeah, uh, I was at that march. forefront Greta. of organizations like the Sunrise Movement that's been pressuring Congress and... Uh, sitting in in congressional offices, including the offices of Democratic leaders like Nancy Pelosi, telling them that they need to do more to address the climate situation. So I think the role of students now is incredibly important and inspiring. And I see <clears throat> in this generation of students a very high level of motivation because they know that their future is at stake. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. Um, you know, of course, you know, when you're marching with the students, you know, you're seeing all this motivation right around you, but that's just the people that are coming out. And so that's why I was asking, because I've seen so much um, complacency, I think, over the years of young people not getting involved. And it's kind of surprised me because it is their future. And yes, as an older generation person, you know, we've, we're the ones that have messed it up so bad and generations before us, but, you know, we really, I'm trying to motivate them in my little way and you are in yours to um, have them take this up because it is their future. And the planet is really at just such a crossroads now that if we you don't do something immediately on a, in a big scale, um, you know, they're not, the planet's going to be a very different place, a very different yes. place. And, and it's uh, already a different place than it was five or 10 years ago. And the pace is accelerating and we need to act now. And certainly the students I work with in environmental studies are aware of that. Some of their peers, of course, are not. And uh, I hear about interesting conversations that happen, say, between my students in environmental studies and maybe their peers in economics who are who are being taught the opposite. And uh, this scenario is playing out in their generation just as it did in ours. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but I see so many young people, you know, choosing to not have children, for instance, because they just don't want to bring people into this world. Um, into the world as it is. And, you know, I keep saying to those people, you know, we need conscious people to be the ones having the kids to raise kids that are going to care about the planet. 
Um, you know, if only the people that think everything is fine and dandy um, are the ones that have kids, you know, we'll be right. in a bad place. So um, I want to just quickly, before we run out of time, touch on the Institute for Social Ecology. I know you were the director for seven years, um, and it's a great organization. Can you just tell my listeners a little bit about it? Sure. The Institute has been around since the mid-1970s. It was founded by uh, my friend Dan Chodorkoff, who's still uh, the chair of our board, uh, and Murray Bookchin, who's really one of the most important eco-philosophers of our generation. Uh, he passed away in 2006, and we're looking at some events to commemorate the 100th anniversary of his birth, which is coming up just next year. Social ecology is a very holistic outlook on the relationship between our human communities and the natural world and the historical, evolu the historical evolution of that relationship, how um, problems of social hierarchy and domination in human societies through history <clears throat> excuse me, have helped create the sense of separation between our communities and the rest of nature that have become part of contemporary culture, together with an understanding that if we look at the broad <clears throat> sweep of human history, that it's possible for people to live much more sustainably and to live more holistically in relationship with the earth. So we look at the social and political and economic roots of the climate crisis and all our other environmental problems and see that as rooted in a particular set of political and social relationships that we know we can work to transform. And the Institute has been doing this work now for um, <clears throat> well over 40 years, oh, actually over 45 years now. Um, we used to have a campus here in central Vermont. Uh, since we lost that back in the mid-2000s, we've been doing intensive seminars around the country. Of course, this year, uh, it's all moved online. And as a result, uh, the seminar we held this past June was the most international program we've ever run. We had students from almost every continent, uh, activists from the Philippines and India and Central Europe and Zimbabwe and various parts of South America joining us along with folks from the U.S. and Canada to study these ideas, to study both, again, the critical dimension and also the reconstructive dimension, how we rebuild our communities from the ground up using structures of direct democracy, like we have through our uh, annual town meetings here in Vermont, um, to really organize to change the world. That's what the Institute is really mostly about. People can look us up online at social-ecology.org. We have a, an eight-week online class coming up that uh, is a basic overview of the ideas of social ecology. We have a YouTube site where people can look at some of the videos from our past programs. Uh, just yesterday, we had, a, again, an incredibly international group of 80 people from uh, various countries joining us for a dialogue about the current movement of people in the Kurdish regions of Syria and Turkey who have been using some of these same ideas of organizing from the ground up, using direct democracy to transform their communities in the middle of a war zone. And that's really one of the, I think, the most inspiring movements in the world today that's very much inspired by the ideas of social ecology. So check us out at social-ecology.org, check us out on YouTube, and come and join us if you want to learn about um, how we can use a, a much more holistic understanding of our relationship and our potential relationship to the rest of the natural world to really transform our communities. Wow. 
so, you know, between your book and, um, you know, being on the board of the Institute for Social Ecology, and I know you're also on the board of 350 Vermont, which, um, for those that don't know, Bill McKibben, who started 350.org, 350 Vermont is also working in the same way towards um, divesting from fossil fuel and yep. making people aware of the amount of carbon in the atmosphere and how we can't survive if it keeps going up. So um, all your work is just just so inspiring, and I just want to thank you so much for taking the time again to join us today, um, Brian. It's just been wonderful. So thank you thank so much. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to talk with you and hope we'll get to do it again. Great. And everyone out there listening, I wish you all a wonderful rest of the week. Again, if you are in New York, please join us at Columbus Circle at 1 o'clock on Sunday for a Climate Justice Through Racial Justice March for the beginning of Climate Week, which will be going on all week. So you can also Google Climate Week and just find activities in your area, ways that you can get involved and participate because this is our planet and we want to keep it around. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and see you all again next week. Bye for now.